deliver a manuscript to a prize in Argentina. And this prize in Argentina uh, is traditionally for young writers. It's usually given, it's like a young writer's prize. Although it doesn't say anywhere that, it ha that you have to be young, but it's like traditionally given to young writers. Well, she sent her manuscript with a pseudonym and it won. Huh. And so it was like the craziest, all of the, nobody could believe when they announced the winner and it was a 90 year old woman <laughs> who Borges had first given a prize. So I'm so, so happy that Aurora is, is in here. And she's been a discovery. There's been another discovery too, who is Ebe Uhart. She's another secret writer. Um, Ebe is also Argentine. And you know, and one of the things you'll see is that uh, it's male dominated because of the period of time that, um, that this, uh, you know this period of time, and in Argentina particularly, it was very difficult not uh, not for women to write, but for women to be considered. And so a lot of the women writers are now finally kind of coming back into like people are going back and reading them and realizing that hey wait a second, and and uh, she's uh, she's one of those, and Eve Uhart is one of those. Eve is she's got to be in her late seventies. Now I, I can't. Re I'm sorry, I don't remember all the dates like I remember Mello, but um, she uh, is now really being discovered a lot. And um, she she's a philosopher, and she has this kind of sen her sense of humor makes her tr like always appear silly, so that doesn't help. But. Um, she was it's kind of like in an opposite camp of Borges during a period of time when you couldn't do that, and even less so if you were a woman. Um, but, but because she does this kind of like buffoonery in public, uh, for a long time people weren't taking her seriously. But what she does, she, she comes from the oral tradition, and she loves to listen. And she goes and she travels around Latin America, and she goes like way back into small rural vi villages and listens to the way people really speak, and um, and she's like kind of capturing those forms of expression in a very uh, unusual way, and um, we're actually we published a piece of hers in um, the new issue, this new issue of Granta that just came out, Granta in Spanish that just came out, which I have here. This is. This is it. <laughs> Just came out only in Spanish, though, unfortunately. Um, and Ebe's in, in there, and um, she's also like on now getting a lot of press. So, so that's very that's wonderful when you find that writers who really deserve it are being discovered. So I'm glad if if anybody had discovered <coughs> her by her being here, that that would be a a very satisfying thing. <laughs> so, anything else? First passage you read, um, mm -hmm. you spoke a lot about how lyricism is what sets his those particular pages apart. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever find that like some of the lyricism was lost in translation at all, or do you really do you think that it came across well in the English? I mean, that, that yeah. passage you read definitely did. Mm -hmm. but uh, well, that's that's one of the difficult things of translation, isn't it? Is um, sometimes uh, not translating the words, but translating the force behind the words um, correctly, and the effect of a of a passage is um, is very difficult, and I uh, in in the translation divide, I kind of I follow Elliot Weinberger. Um, he's a translator who he wrote twenty points. You can find them on on the internet. He wrote twenty points, and um, he really believes in kind of along the Gregory Rabassa line too. And and if you were uh, a very funny Gabriel Garcia Marquez in, in the Paris Review, his his um, interview in the Paris Review is, is really interesting, and it talks about his work with Gre Gregory Rabassa and and um, and how. Translation is always a rendering. Mm -hmm. um, if you try and keep literally to the words, um, chances are you're going to lose what the words are supposed to mean. Mm -hmm. And um, so in a, when you have a poem, like a lot of people um, try to measure uh, the value of a translation line by line. And that's not really how a translation should work. I mean, of course, you've got to stay close on the original as much as you can because it sh the translator should be as, as transparent as possible. The translator shouldn't have a style that you can see every single time 
you read it and, and you say, oh, it's the same translator, I can tell. You shouldn't, shouldn't do that. But um, the rendering is a very fine thing. And sometimes one sentence, you, you can't do it in one sentence. You have to do it in four sentences so that you get the overall effect. And what you're trying to do in a translation is, is give an effect. And, and that effect of reading is what, when you're reading it in Spanish, that same lyricism should be translated into, into the home language. But it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. And really, translation is all about in, having an ear. It's all about ear. It's all, it's all about hearing, hearing it. And hearing, you're, you're hearing something that doesn't sound, of course you can read it out loud, but, but when you're translating, you know, it's, it's all about ca catching the, the music and the melody and the lyricism. <laughs> yeah, I have a second question. Um, sure. So it's the best of the best. Do you have a best of the best of the best, like your favorite? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I have never been asked that question before. <laughs> um, let's see. I know a lot of people have talked about the Maria's chapter because Maria's took it very seriously and a lot of people consider that it's like really a mini essay on his style and on his intentions in literature and he liked it a lot too and tweeted tweeted it and he put it on his blog he didn't of course he still sends faxes but um, <laughs> his somebody did it for him um, so so a lot of people like that and I did too because I like I, I mean it was a privilege to spend time talking about literature with, with Javier Marias. I mean, like, pinch me. <laughs> but um, I think I think one of the ones that I liked a lot, and that actually for me was a discovery. Um, well, Juan Marce. I mean, Juan Marce was no discovery for me. But he said a lot of things that he hadn't said in other interviews before. Um, and he, he talked about Teresa. Uh, I don't know if, if you know Juan Marce. Well, he has, he has a book with a character called Teresa. And, um, uh, and he kind of talked about Teresa, the original Teresa, and how, how it came about. And I thought that was really, really touching. Um, that conversation. Also the conversation with Ana Maria Matute was amazing too, with Ana Maria Matute and Esther Tusquets um, because, because Ana Maria Matute was very, very old and very frail and she talked about how during her, uh, her generation um, women weren't allowed, like women of a certain class in Spain weren't allowed to go to the university. Good, good girls didn't go to the university. That, that, that didn't happen. And by the end of her talk, she was saying, but I got him back. I'm a doctor honoris causa. You know, so she, 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 she was like, she's she'll, still so feisty, you know. And that was a, a real, and she said, you know, I, I would have loved to study mathematics and poetry because I, like, Later in life, I've been learning poetry. She she's, was studying Arthurian um, literature, and and so so she never got a chance to do that, you know. But but yet she came so far despite everything. And the other one is Esther Tusquets, and Esther Tusquets um, was very ill. And Esther Tusquets is very important for for Spanish language literature because she uh, she was the one that brought Virginia Woolf back, um, and and advocated Virginia Woolf and uh, and was a figure like a beloved figure for a lot of people during again during a period of time when women weren't you know it was very hard for them to to act and um, Esther used to like play poker and have wild parties and so she was like also kind of a center of like literary life in Barcelona for a long time and she she so when I was talking to her she was very ill and she was di dying and um, she didn't have, all of her days weren't good days. So I had to kind of like, uh, they would call me in the morning to kind of say, you know, today's not a good day, let's try next week. And, you know, and then the next day, it's not a good day. And so I, I was kind of on call for her for a long time, but she really wanted to do it. 
And so she, she was like fighting to be able to do it and I was just like waiting to have the chance to talk to her in, in a lucid moment. And I could see when, you know, and, and we would try and try and, you know. And so for me that like means a lot, you know, that I actually got her. And oddly enough, I'll tell you a little insider thing, um, oddly enough, just before Frankfurt, the Frankfurt Book Fair, um, an <coughs> agent called me and asked me for a favor. She said, We're tra uh, Milena Busquets, who is Esther Tusquets' daughter, because Esther Tusquets married somebody whose last name was Busquets, so we have Milena Tus Busquets Tusquets. <laughs> so Milena Busquets um, just wrote a novel, and we think it's pretty special, and we'd, we want to bring it to Frankfurt, but it has to be translated into English. A week before Frankfurt. <gasps> and I said, you've got to be kidding. Translating a, not an entire novel in a week, that's just like impossible, it can't be done. And, but I thought about her mother and I, I kind of felt like at least I should look at it. And so they sent it to me. And so I started reading it. And it is Milena's, it's a novel but it's about the process of grief over the death of her mother. How could I possibly say no? So I just thought, okay, get the coffee going, get the coffee going. And I sat down and I translated the novel and I got it finished. And in Frankfurt, it sold to 22 languages. And in, in the US, for more than half a million, to Hogarth Press. So it's coming out it's probably coming out either the end of 2015 or the beginning of 2016, and I do think if they spent that amount of money, it's because they think the thing is going to be big. So we're all going to be hearing about um, Milena Busquets and Esther Tusquets when that happens, and so so that like is kind of a very exciting thing that somebody as as kind of fundamental as as Esther. Um, is being remembered in such a wonderful way. I mean, because uh, what Esther chose, she chose two different things, and in the end, we only used one. But in the Tusquets family, um, the mothers and daughters write to each other like a letter. Uh, Esther wrote one to her mother, and so this, what is coming out, is is really Milena's letter to her mother. Um, and here, Esther chose the letter to her mother, and then um, what's called the orchestra, the summer orchestra. Um, and in the end, we didn't use letter to my mother because it was long, and it, you know, um, and so we only used orchestra, uh, summer orchestra. But it's um, all, it's also part of the letter to her mother. So, um, so that, so that's probably one of the things that for me was the reason why I did it. So that people will read us to kids. Thank you. And uh, one, maybe one last person. Um, well, Sergio Pito also. I mean, there's so many good ones, but I'm trying to think of like special things that I, anecdotes that I can tell. Horacio is so crazy. <laughs> the, the piece in here by Horacio Castellanos Moya is like just a study in paranoia. <laughs> it's, it's the greatest, it's the greatest, and like the psychology of par paranoia. Um, Evelio, the, the piece that Evelio, um, that Evelio gave me is also a piece that, um, you know, he's Colombian and uh, it's a piece about um, the disappeared people who disappeared in Colombia. So it's very, um, it's a very beautiful piece. And he was the only one that said, "Take this piece and the way it is, and this is why I'm choosing it." And it's it's very kind of it, it's for the children in Colombia, and, and it's like the healing process of how to get over the disappearance of like family and loved ones <coughs> and, and the whole town. So, well, anyway. I think, is that good? Okay, well thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for having this. Good night. Thank you, Val.